there is one theorem in mathematics that is incredibly important. In fact, it has practically defined calculus since its inception. In this video, I'm going to explain what this theorem really is and how it hides in almost all areas of calculus. Many calculus students have heard of or even used Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, and Gauss's divergence theorem. All three are incredibly useful results in vector calculus, which have many applications, such as calculating the area of irregular shapes, analyzing the movement of hurricanes and currents, and describing the properties of magnets, among a multitude of other useful properties. What if I told you that all of these things were the exact same theorem that I mentioned at the beginning, just in disguise? In fact, they are all extensions of one of the first things you learn in calculus, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's take a look at what this theorem really means. In Calculus 1 courses, the fundamental theorem of calculus is often taught like this. When you have a function little f of x, and its antiderivative big F of x, the integral of a little f of x between two points a and b will be equal to big F of b minus big F of a. This definition works quite well for the purposes of someone learning or using Calculus 1, but for our purposes, it needs to be generalized. To simplify it, let's remove all mention of calculus terms and see if we can explain it like we would to someone who hasn't taken calculus. So, going back to our definition, when you have a function big F of x, and you split it up into very small pieces, the final change from f of a to f of b is the sum of all those little infinitely small changes. This seems extremely straightforward and even obvious, but this one change has made this definition so much more powerful. Because now, we don't need to just focus on functions which are one-dimensional lines or curves. Let's add a dimension. This is a vector field. It's useful to imagine it as a current of water or fluid, where the size of the vectors at each point signifies how fast the fluid is moving there. At this point, the water is moving slowly since the arrows are small. Here, it's moving faster since the arrows are larger. Vector fields have a useful property we're concerned about. They're curl. How do we imagine curl? Imagine you put a stick in the current of water at a certain point. The curl here would essentially be how fast the stick rotates at this point. If the value for curl at the center of the stick is positive and high, the stick rotates quickly counterclockwise. If it's negative, the stick rotates the other way. Also, counterclockwise being positive is just a useful convention, just like the right-hand rule you may have seen in physics. Okay, so now we know what vector fields are, we know what curl is, but how does this have anything to do with the fundamental theorem of calculus? Let's go back to the vector field, or water current, in our analogy. Imagine that we now section off a portion of this water with a very fine membrane so that the water can still move through it without affecting its speed. Sometimes, it is useful for us to know the total sum of all the curl inside this shape we've sectioned off. You can think of this as sort of how much this entire area would spin. How do we do this? Well, the most intuitive way to do it is to section off little tiny pieces of this large area and put a little stick in each one. As the amount of pieces goes to infinity, their area goes to zero, and they essentially become points. And then, we can just measure the curl at each point. Then, if we add up all the curls for all the points, we can get the total curl of the area. While this does work, usually we don't have access to every single point or every single little piece of an area we're trying to observe. So how would we get the curl without this information? Let's now think back to the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says that for a one-dimensional line, the difference between the zero-dimensional endpoints is the sum of all the changes between them. Now, let's finally add a dimension to this. For a two-dimensional shape, the change across the one-dimensional boundary is the sum of all the changes inside the boundary. Wait. Isn't this exactly what we were trying to find out for our shape inside the flow of water? The sum of all the changes in rotation, or curls, on the inside is equal to the curl calculated across the boundary. 
So instead of measuring values for the curl everywhere on the inside of the shape, we can just walk around the boundary of it and measure the curl there, and the result will be the same. This seems absurd though, why is it true? Let's get some visual intuition for it. When we sectioned off our shape into little squares, each of those little squares had its own section of the vector field, and therefore its own curl. When we're calculating the total curl in an area, positive curls and negative curls cancel out. You can imagine this as if we put a stick in the water and there are two currents on it at almost the same place going in opposite directions. They would cancel out, and the stick wouldn't rotate. So, on the edge of each of these little squares, we can simply cancel out the vectors going in opposite directions, since their net contribution to the curl is zero when they're added up. But we can do this for every edge. On every edge where two squares border each other, we can cancel out the two vectors on either side because they don't contribute a net curl. What does this leave us with? Is the curl zero? No, we still have the very outer edge of the shape where the edges of our little squares haven't been canceled out with each other since they don't border anything. This matches up perfectly with our earlier definition. Let's take a look at it again. For a 2D shape, the change across the 1D boundary is the sum of all the changes inside it. This is called Green's Theorem. But essentially, what we have done is just upscaled the fundamental theorem of calculus to two dimensions, and using curl instead of a derivative. This is written in mathematical notation like this. The left side represents the line integral, or boundary of the region A, which is equal to the right side, which represents the area of the region. If you want to learn more about the actual math behind it, there are some great resources I've linked down in the description, which I highly recommend checking out. Green's theorem is just one of many theorems in calculus that use this concept. There are plenty of others also derived from the fundamental theorem of calculus. One of them is Gauss's divergence theorem, which uses divergence instead of curl. So instead of being whirlpools, we imagine each little square as either a water pump or a sink, which either absorbs or produces water. Stokes' theorem is similar to these theorems, but instead of integrating over a flat surface, we integrate over one in 3D. This concept has a ton of applications. I'll go over the three basic ones that were mentioned at the beginning of the video. Finding the area of an irregular region becomes simple. Just replace the vector field used earlier for either curl or divergence with a vector field which scales with the area of the shape, such as this one. Integrating across the boundary will then give you the area of the region. In a similar fashion, wind movements are also just vector fields of air. We can analyze how fast a hurricane is spinning using its curl, or how fast a storm is growing using its divergence. And charged particles, and any other force like gravity or magnetism, also produce a vector field. Just this one is called an electric field, or in the case of gravity or magnets, a gravitational field or a magnetic field. We can find out how strong a magnet is, or how much mass a planet has, just by measuring the strength of the vector field at some arbitrary boundary around them. Beyond these examples, the fundamental theorem of calculus, and the theorems derived from it, can be used to describe essentially anything that is a sum of changes. That's all for the video, and again, please do take a look at the resources linked in the description below, as they are invaluable tools if you want to learn more about this area of math. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.